Good people of YouTube, my name is Spanner. Welcome back to Deathgate. So last time we had an audience with King Stephen, and now we're inside his um his mage's chambers. So we were looking at this shelf and we got this book. So let's read the book. Tower of the Brotherhoods. Oh, okay, I'm in control. The Mystery Arcs. At the risk of sounding immodest, no society of wizards since the ancient Sartan has gathered more knowledge or commanded such power. We are unequaled. Indeed, other wizards have begun to view us as a threat. Because of this, and for other reasons as well, we have decided to move into the High Realm. There we will be able to focus our attention on learning. We will be free from the petty concerns that dominate the minds of those who have enslaved themselves to war. To this end, it was necessary to construct ships, procure cargo and supplies, and obtain building materials for our new cities. Some of the needed supplies were scarce, were scarce, others were illicit, or under the control of the elves, with whom we ourselves are currently at war. Thus we were forced to rely on the trade in contraband. The smuggling trade is regulated by an organization called the Brotherhoods, which rules over the trading routes with an iron fist. Our decision to make use of the Brotherhoods was a difficult one, but we were left with no alternative. For the first time in our history, we needed help. The Brotherhoods The Brotherhood is a guild of assassins, but its membership wields enormous political power through their connections to people placed at the highest level of government. Their reputation is spotless. I have never known of a contract that wasn't eventually ex executed so to speak. Uh, given this, it's understandable that their services don't come cheap. Over the course of thousands of years, the Brotherhood has amassed a fortune, sufficient in size to buy and sell most kingdoms a few times over. In addition to the money have come relics, treasures and information, surpassing the wildest dreams of any museum or library. But when it came to safeguarding these precious possessions, the Brotherhoods turned to us. They sought our assistance in the creation of a magic fortress in which their operations could be centralized, and their treasure stores. At that time, and after much debate, we sent them packing, only to ultimately discover some advantage in assisting them. For the Brotherhood had exactly what we needed limitless funds and strong connections in every market. Not only were they willing to give us enough to buy 10 times what we required, they would make the elusive suppliers available to us. So we agreed. The Tower From the beginning, many of us viewed the task as an intellectual challenge. The magics required to build such a fortress would involve spell merges and constructs heretofore unknown. We see it as a way to increase our knowledge and enhance our abilities. It was a deal with the devil, of course, but never before had we, had we been able to concentrate so many diverse talents on a single goal. The potential for unparalleled growth was enormous. The construction itself was relatively simple. We incorporated enough secret passages and magic portals into the fortress to keep even the most paranoid assassin happy. Merely to open the front door requires an intricate and exhaustive ritual. The door could have been made easier to operate while equally secure, but the members of the Brotherhood wanted the doorway to feel complex. Ah well, they're the ones who now have to remember half a page of nonsense gestures simply to enter their home. The most interesting part of the project was the vault. The Brotherhood's ongoing quest to gather all of the Sartan artifacts in the realms had left them with a number of priceless pieces. One of our top priorities was to build a storage room to house them, something completely secure. 
We thought long and hard about the best way to protect their treasures. Eventually, we all agreed that the safest place to put them was the Otherware. The Otherware is a place between realities, a place of possibilities only. Every possibility exists there, however remote. That's what a wizard draws upon when he casts a spell. Say, for example, that he wants to create light in a dark room. In Otherware, the possibility exists that the room is already lit. With a spell, he bends this possibility into this reality, until the room is lit. All magic is merely the changing of reality by capitalizing on a possibility that already exists. Every creative idea exists there. When an artist dreams of something new, he makes a pocket in the otherware that holds his idea. The possibility that it exists in this reality, however remote, is never nothing. Every painting, every picture, is a window into the otherware. It was this property that we decided to use. Specialized magic allows us to put real things into the otherware and summon them out again. The simplest form of this magic is the Create Reality Pocket spell, although the name is a misnomer, though it's the spell we got. It does not actually create a reality pocket, it merely causes a picture to become a bridge or passageway to the pocket that already exists inside the other wear. Many wizards already use this spell to store items inside the other wear using a painting large enough to walk through. The Brotherhood's Vault was designed to function as a step beyond this. We constructed a special chamber in the tower called the Vault. Most of the room, all except the platform in the center, was intended to house the Brotherhood's treasure. The platform was to serve as the room's safe area, the place where the complex spells were going to be cast, and eventually from where the treasures would be summoned and banished. The chamber was filled with the treasure and five mystery arcs took to the platform. Working in concert, they magicked a portal to the otherware. Unlike the simple Create Reality Pocket spell, this portal was permanent. Everything in the chamber, not upon the awarded platform in the center, was transported into the otherware. Naturally, the Brotherhood wanted to be able to retrieve their treasure and they lacked the magic ability to summon it back themselves. So we created a link in the spell, a set of key crystals. While these crystals are in place, they break the spell. Much like a hand can interrupt a beam of sunlight, everything previously banished to the other wear will materialize and remain until the crystals are removed. We constructed a pedestal inside the warded platform. When the crystals are placed on this pedestal, they will unlock the spell and summon the treasure. The Brotherhood found this solution acceptable, but decided to add a further level of security as well. The treasure chamber was hidden behind a wall covered with carved handprints. Each handprint was inlaid with a different material, usually gemstones, to distinguish them from each other. When these handprints were pressed in a certain order, the wall would, the wall would open. We constructed the wall based on their specifications and made some further recommendations. The correct sequence that would open the wall did not have to be the same all of the time. We added a method to change the sequence based on the time of the month. Of course, we left the actual entry codes up to the Brotherhood. They wanted the entry codes to remain a secret, even from us. The Brotherhood trusts no one. I believe that, had they been powerful enough to eliminate everyone associated with the construction, they would have done so. Only the fact that we intended to leave the Mid-Realms made the Brotherhood rest easy. I surmise that if they knew that this text existed, they would stop at nothing to destroy it. Very interesting, I wonder if we'll go into the tower. Most of the books collected here deal with magic, but none show the actual spells. Furniture is tasteful and expensive. This living chamber is re reminiscent of a library, obviously it belongs to someone of learning. An expertly woven tapestry hangs on the wall. It depicts a dungeon cell containing an elven prisoner. Alright, let's use the magic here and create a magic pocket.
You weave the spell in the air. Suddenly the tapestry becomes a window into a scene, instead of just a picture of it. It appears as if you could walk right into it. You step through the tapestry, into a dank dungeon cell. This is the archetype of a dungeon cell, spartan and devoid of all unnecessary furnishings. The glow lamp is affixed to the stone wall, it doesn't dispel the dank murkiness of the cell very well. Can't take it. The metal bars are narrow, but incredibly strong. Okay, let's speak with the wizard. Why would you think that I want to talk to another dirty, stinking human? Why don't you just leave me alone before you start making me angry? You don't look like you're in any position to make demands. I may not be able to leave, but I certainly don't have to waste my time talking with you. Waste time? What else are you going to do? Sit here and not talk to you. Okay, let's try this again. Why would you think that I want... Why are you here? I was unlucky enough to let myself be captured by Trian. I suppose it's better than if the king caught me. He would have executed me for sure. Trian's keeping me alive to get whatever information he can. So far, I've told him nothing, and that's just what you're going to get as well. You don't like humans? You are barbarians. Uncouth, unclean. Fit only to be slaves or dead. Your only hope for civilization is to be conquered by the elven nation. So, do you like these accommodations? What do you think? I'm stuck in an archetypical dungeon cell. The light in the wall never shuts off. I haven't had anything to eat or drink for hours. Oh, what I wouldn't give for some wine right now. Alright, I'll leave you alone. Good. Bugger off. Well, I do have some wine. Yeah, it's filled. Ah, it's gooseberry wine. Okay, the wizard warily accepts the wine jug from you. He sniffs, he sniffs it and takes a tentative sip. He tilts the jug back and takes a few hearty slugs. Afterwards, when he has placed it on the bench, he regards you with a much friendlier expression. I guess you're not so bad for a human. It wouldn't hurt to pass a little time talking. So, you're a wizard, huh? Of course I am. I'm only of the fourth house, but it makes me formidable nonetheless. If I hadn't been distracted by that serving wench, Treen would never have gotten the drop on me. If you're so powerful, why haven't you escaped? Every time Treen casts the Create Reality Pocket spell, he summons this cell from the otherware. After he leaves, the cell is cast adrift back into the otherware. It's impossible to make that connection from this side. Even if I could break through these bars, I wouldn't be able to leave the cell until Trian returned and re-established the link. At that point, he would keep me from escaping. Can you teach me any spells? Interested in magic, eh? I don't reveal my secrets to just anyone, you understand, especially not to humans. He gives you an appraising look, as if hatching a devious idea. You decide to change subjects. If you hate this dungeon so much, can't you use your magic to change it? Well, if I could get out of these bars, I'd probably douse that glow lamp on the wall. It's impossible to get any sleep with the lamp always shining in my eyes. In order to remove the glow spell that's on it, I'd have to create a shroud of darkness and place it over the lamp, and it's out of reach. <sighs> Maybe I could do it? How exactly does that shroud of darkness spell go? Come here, I'll show you. He shows you an impish smile. He approaches the bars and stands there. Hesitantly, you too approach the bars. Now first you need a black cloth. The color is important because black absorbs all light. When you place the prepared cloth over the glowing object, the cloth is going to do just that. Absorb the light, albeit to an even greater extent. Then you cast the Shroud of Darkness spell upon it, like so. His hands cut gracefully through the air, tracing a glowing magic rune structure. You watch entranced as the spell takes shape. The wizard completes the structure, it hangs in the air and you study, study it intently. Focused on memorizing the spell, you fail to observe the wizard's hand slipping into motion again. Suddenly his hand grabs yours and he jerks you out of your trance. Another spell hangs in the air. 
Benignly, the first spell fades away, but the new spell begins to take effect. You are staring at the new rune construct in confusion, your hand locked in his iron grip when you notice a tingling sensation spread through your body. A thunderclap later and you notice that you are looking at the floating spell from the other side. Immediately, the wizard releases your hand and through the bars, you see him race out of the room laughing. The spell fades and you realize that the wizard used his magic to swap positions with you. You are now the prisoner in the cell and he is free. You drop heavily to the bench. After hours of waiting, Trian walks into the cell. Seeing you sitting on the bench stops him in his tracks. You clear your throat and explain what has transpired. He listens intently and after a moment of thought decides to free you. Trian escorts you into his personal chamber. He explains that he was keeping the wizard secret from the king, so he cannot report the escape. He tells you to forget that you ever saw him and asks you to leave the same way you entered. Trian walks out the door and locks it behind him. Oh, I wanted, I wanted to talk to the guy some more. Wait, did I, did I actually learn the spell? I think I did. Oh, I learned Swap and Shroud of Darkness. So I learned two. Hold on. Uh, okay, let me just go back in time and uh, speak with the elf again. I want to get as much information from him, from him as possible. So, what information is Trian trying to get out of you? Okay, He's we're back. To get information about troop movements and war strategies. The problem is, I don't know anything about those things. I'm not going to tell him that, of course. His hope of getting that information is the only thing that keeps me alive. Where are you from? I am a royal wizard from the Tribus Empire, loved and revered throughout the Elven Nation. Although I didn't serve the Emperor himself, I served a lord very close to him. Where exactly are we? We're in a tapestry, right? Something like that. The spell that Trian used on the tapestry created a pocket of reality. This cell exists only in the otherware, a place of infinite realities. It was created when the artist made the tapestry. The spell connects a bridge between the real world and this room. When the caster leaves the pocket, he severs the tie and the pocket is cast adrift back into the otherware. How long have you been here? A few weeks. It has been hellish. Trian has treated me abysmally. Even though you human barbarians have no manners, I was under the impression that traditional respect between wizards would have resulted in better treatment. So, you're a wizard, huh? Okay, let's go through this again. Oh, that's right, we have a lot more things here. If you're so powerful, why haven't you escaped? Every time tree. Okay, skip that. Skip this spells? one. Interested in. If you hate this. D well, if I. Okay, let's not select the Shroud of Darkness yet. What do you know about the Elven ship on Drevlin? I think that's where we get our water, right? Elves have had control of that area for years. I know that you humans would love to take Drevlin for your own, but I'm certainly not going to help you do that. Do you know anything about the Kixie Winzy? No, not really. It's been there forever, and it makes water. I think that there are dwarves there, right? I know you hate humans. What do you think of dwarves? Humans are enemies. You are barbarians. I suppose you rate hate. But dwarves are nothing. They are meaningless. As long as they serve our purposes, let them. It doesn't really matter how we get them to do it. Okay, let's go through this again How then. Exactly, does that shroud of darkness spell go? Come here. Now. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So we got two spells. We got um, swap and the darkness and the shroud of darkness. And we need a black cloth. I guess that's why I w I was able to make a um, a black T-shirt. So with this new, um, I believe the Shroud of Darkness will be very useful in um, 
in stopping the elves from glowing. Okay, let's get out of here. Can I speak with Jar again? Hello again. What would you like to talk about now? The gods again? I've enjoyed talking. Okay, oh, same thing. Okay, now we got a candle holder for Limbeck here. This is much better than the pipe I was using. It's very thoughtful of you to offer it. He gingerly removes the candle from the straight pipe, hands the pipe over to you to hold, and jams the candle into the holder. Enthralled, he sets it down on the corner of the table, admiring the holder and completely forgetting about the pipe. Sorry, but I'm using this one. If you I'd really like to know what's on the other side of the parchment. Uh, anyway, so we have four pipes now. So let's do what we've done before. Use magic, heat magic on the sensor. Heat. And go to the elven ship. Oh, don't quit. I want to save. Let's go up. Now. Um, do I need to cast it on the shirt? Or place the shirt on the figurines and then cast it. Let's try this. No, I... Okay, no. So let's cast a spell on the shirt. Now, we've also learned the spell Swap. So... We'll see how that works. Shroud of Darkness. As you weave the spell around the shirt, the light around you dims as if the shirt was drawing it in. When the spell has been completed, you can only make out the vague shape of the shirt, but none of its features. It looks like a hole in the air. Okay, put the black shirt on the figurines. You drape the black shirt over the glowing figurines, the magic of the shroud draws the light from the statuettes into itself until they remain dull and grey. Okay, now this should put things into motion. Since it is the magic of the fi on the figurines that maintains the glow effects on the gods, the instant the magic disappears, so does the elves' spell. They quickly realize their situation and bolt for the ship. The dwarves, seeing their gods without their glow, quickly form a lynch mob. They chase the hapless elves out of the caves, bellowing rather imaginative and graphic threats of violence. The noise causes the sleeping wizard to stir. To keep from being discovered, you dive out of his quarters onto the ship's deck. Oh, I'm still on the ship? Hold on, things are happening here. You bump into the group of elves boarding the ship just ahead of the mob of dwarves. The look of surprise on their faces when they see you are almost immediately replaced by expressions of anger. Two of the elves grab your arms while another calls for the ship's wizard. He appears from his quarters and quickly weaves a spell of death, which on one hand is a very useful spell to learn, on the other hand it's a rather fatal way to learn it. Okay. Uh, hmm. So I can't leave. Let's go down. They'll kill you if they find you here. From the deck, you hear the scuffling of the elves as they board the ship. The duke whispers to you again. Hide in the storeroom. They'll kill you if they find you there. He points out a hidden door in the back of the galley, off to the west. You hear some scuffling and shouted orders from the galley. Soon, the ship breaks away from its moorings and lifts off. A deep voice booms from somewhere near the door that the ship is entering human-controlled space. All lights must be doused and all noise ceased. If the, human, if the humans discover the ship's exact position, it could be taken. Ah, okay, so we've spoken to the king. 
and he wants us to get the elves out of there and we have so now we're in human controlled space so the king can attack and recover his cousin however apparently we need to create some light so we, we will do that but we will do that next time for now thank you guys for watching hope you enjoyed some more death gate and as usual don't miss the next episode because i won't i will see you all next time